will be a blessing. Let's turn over to Psalms 103. I've been teaching on imagination and I haven't got time to go back and, and say everything I've already said. I've, I never get through with what I've got to say. I just quit. And then I start again and I'm, I'm just continuing to teach on it. I don't know exactly um, how to go back and tell you what I've been talking about, but it's been awesome. You need to get the DVDs or the CDs. How many of you, this is your first service that you've made. Could I see your, see your hand? Wow, a bunch of you. It's really good, so please go back and get it. But we've been talking about the power of imagination, what your imagination is. And this morning, I'm going to deal with some things that will explain that a lot better. But I want you to look here in Psalms 103 and in verse 14. Or let me read verse 13. It says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Man, that is quite a statement. God is a merciful God. God understands us. God himself became dust. God himself became a man. God has compassion on us. God knows what we are. And what I wanted to point out in this 14th verse, it says, he remembereth our frame. Did you know that that word frame in the Hebrew is Y-E-S-E-R? This is what I've been talking about during this entire thing. This word was translated imagination all of these times in the scripture. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Genesis 11, 6, uh, Isaiah 26, 3, and I've given all of these examples. This is talking about God knows our imagination. That's the exact word that was used here. Your imagination is like a frame that your whole being is built around. You know, if we build a float for our uh, December um, Christmas parade and stuff, and you have to build a frame to put all of this stuff on. We just built sets for this production that we did and they have to build a frame. A framework is like a skeleton. It's what holds things up. If we didn't have a skeleton, uh, we'd be a blob. Some of us are already a blob. We'd be a bigger blob, amen. <laughs> But we, we, a frame is what holds things up. Your imagination is what you are built around. Your whole being is built around your imagination. I think that is a significant statement right here. And he remembers our frame. He remembers our imagination like Genesis chapter six, verse five, that the imagination of men was only evil continually and it grieved him in his heart. The Lord wants to change this. And through the new birth, we have now the ability to use our imagination in a positive way. The, the word, yes, sir, that was translated imagination in frame here, it literally means conception. It's where you conceive things. If you can't see it in your imagination, then you can't see it with your eyes. Imagination is just an ability to see something that you can't see with your eyes. And I've already used 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, where it says, we are seeing things that can't be seen. That's talking about your imagination. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says that we walk by faith and not by sight. That's talking about your imagination. You're seeing things that you can't see. Look over here in Ephesians chapter 4, and let me use these verses. I tell you, this subject on imagination, it's not always called an imagination. I'm gonna deal more with that in just a second. But this principle is just all through the Word of God. You cannot relate to God without an imagination. You can't remember without an imagination. You can't believe without an imagination. You can't give direct directions without an imagination. You can't function without an imagination. Everything you do, you know, if you parked your car, you know what, you can't see where your car is right now, but you can imagine where it is because you remember it was parked next to this or it was under this tree or it was out there. You have a picture of where it is. And if you didn't have an imagination, you couldn't remember things, you couldn't communicate, you couldn't give directions. It, it, our whole life is built around this. And over here in Ephesians chapter four, 
I spent over a year meditating on nothing but Ephesians chapter four one time, and it's one of the most productive years I ever had in the Word of God. And in Ephesians chapter four, verse 17, it says, this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. You know, this doesn't connect with a lot of people, but I've studied this out. And what the word vanity means is the inutility and transientness. Inutility means don't walk like a Gentile, a person that doesn't know the Lord who isn't using their mind. That's a profound statement. You know, sin isn't smart. Sin is stupid. Sin is not smart. You take some of these people that have had great ministries and they're reaching millions of people and then they go in with the prostitute and for whatever gratification, they lose this whole ministry. It devastates them. They enter into shame and on and on. If they were to use their brain for something besides a hat rack and be controlled by their thinking instead of their emotions, they would have never have jeopardized all of that. Sin isn't smart. It's stupid, but yet people sin. People go out and get drunk and it costs them money. You, you take your life in your own hands. You potentially could damage yourself or damage somebody else through a wreck. You could damage your liver. You can do all of these things. Sin isn't smart. Why do people do that? You get sick and throw up the next morning. You know, I just don't throw up. I've been married for 43 years. And Jamie saw me throw up one time right after we got married. And that was the last time. I don't throw up. I would die before I throw up. I don't do that. I hate it. I can't imagine why people would go get drunk and, and make them throw up. It's just stupid. How dumb can you get and still breathe? Did you know sin is not smart? It is stupid. And this is saying, don't walk like a lost man that's not thinking about the consequences. There are consequences to our sins. The wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you want to stay. You do not want to sin. Sin is stupid. Quit it. Don't be like a lost man that just sits there and does whatever feels good and doesn't think about the consequences. So don't walk in the vanity, the inutility of your mind. And the second definition is transientness. You know what transient means? That you don't have a certain dwelling place. When I was a kid, we used to call bums, we, people that lived on the street, we called them bums or sometimes we'd say, call them transients because they didn't have a dwelling place. They just lived wherever, slept under a bridge or whatever. And this is talking about your mind. Don't let your mind wander. Your mind needs to be focused. You need to use your brain, think about what you're doing, be focused on a prize. Over in uh, Proverbs chapter four, it says, let your eyes look right on. Don't look to the right or to the left, but look right on. Ponder the path of your feet. If we would do these kind of things, I guarantee you it would transform our lives. And then the next verse says, this is a continuation of don't walk like a person that doesn't know the Lord in the vanity, the inutility and transiness of your mind. And, it, and if you do that, it says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. If you aren't using your mind, and specifically, there's multiple ways of talking about this, but we've been talking about your imagination, which is a product of your thoughts. And if you aren't using your imagination correctly, it causes your understanding to be darkened. The Greek word for understanding here is dianoia, and it literally means deep thought. There's other words that were used in the Greek to talk about thoughts, but this is specifically talking about deep thoughts, not surface thoughts, not just a casual acquaintance with something, but a deep thought. I believe we could compare it to meditation where you are just focused on something and mulling it over and over and over. This is talking about your understanding becomes darkened. 
And I hadn't got time right now, but if you were to go to the book of Proverbs, if you're familiar with that, the book of Proverbs says the, the most important thing is wisdom. And with all of your getting, get understanding. Wisdom is the application, but you can't apply something until you first of all understand it. Understanding is super important and you can't understand without an imagination. And the reason I bring this out is this Greek word, dianoia, in Luke chapter 1, verse 51, it says that God has, spread, has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. That's the exact same Greek word. This word is talking about your imagination. You can't understand something without your imagination. And if your imagination isn't functioning properly, then you won't have proper understanding. And what's the results of that? The result is that if you, can't, if you have your understanding darkened, then you become alienated from the life of God, which is in you, and your foolish heart becomes darkened. I have an entire series out there on a hardened heart about six hours of teaching about what a hardened heart does. It makes you so that you can't perceive or understand. You have eyes, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear, and on and on. Man, this is a terrible state, and this is describing where so many people are. I have people come to me all of the time and said, would you please pray for me that God would just speak to me, that God would show me his will. And yet Jesus said that his sheep hear his voice and the voice of a stranger they will not hear. He didn't say they can hear his voice. He says they do hear his voice. God is speaking constantly. And I told a couple of people today, I said, look, you don't need me to pray that God will speak to you and give you direction. God is speaking constantly. It's not God speaking that needs to change. It's your hearing. You need to tune your ear to hear God. Why is it that so many Christians don't seem to be able to hear God? Because of their understanding being darkened, because they aren't using their imagination, they aren't taking the Word of God and meditating on it until it forms an image on the inside of them. They have to conceive, you have to conceive hearing God's voice. I'm trying to rush through some things. I could spend a lot more time on that, but look over here in Psalms chapter one. I want to show you this. This is really important. Psalms chapter one. In Psalms chapter one, verse one, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. This says you should meditate in the Word of God day and night. What is meditation? Look at Psalms chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Again, if you study these things instead of just read through it, if you study it, the exact same word that was translated meditate in Psalms 1, 2 was translated imagine in Psalms chapter 2, verse 1. The way you meditate is to imagine. You have to take things that the Word says. So many people just read the Bible on a surface level and they don't get into this deep thought. They don't ever get their understanding changed. I'm amazed at how many people come up to me and they can quote scripture. They've memorized it, but it doesn't make one bit of difference in the way they think or act. They know what the word says, but they have never taken the power that's in that word and applied it to their life. The way you do that is you not only read the Bible, but then you take those truths that you've heard and you meditate on them, which according to these two verses is to imagine them. You think about this. God, what does this mean to my life? And you think about it until it forms an image on the inside. You know, I don't remember if I shared, I, I shared some things along this line with the Bible college students on Wednesday, and I can't remember if I said this Wednesday or Thursday. So anyway, give me mercy if I've already said this. But this is a great example that many, many years ago, I took John chapter 12, verse 14. I think it was here I said this, because I remember talking about Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, the works that I do shall ye do also. 
And I, so I've already shared that here, but I told about how that I took those verses and I started meditating on them, that I'm going to do the same works that Jesus did. And then I went and saw what works he did. And he healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead, and gave us a command. So I started specifically focusing on raising the dead. And I took scriptures on raising the dead. I meditated on them. And over a period of six months, I got to where I was raising 20 or 30 people from the dead in my dreams every night. It, I was so focused on it. You know what I was doing? I was meditating and it quickened my imagination and I saw myself raising the dead. And not long after that, I saw a man raised from the dead. And then 12 years later, I thought, man, it's been 12 years since I've seen a person raised from the dead. I started doing the same thing and I saw my own son raised from the dead after being dead for five hours, come back to life with no brain damage. And I'm telling you, there is a direct relationship between meditating. Many of you can quote John 14, 12, that verily the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. And if somebody preaches on that, you say, yes, amen. But have you ever seen anybody raised from the dead? Have you ever seen a blind eye open? Have you ever seen the deaf hear? Have you ever seen the lame walk? Many of you have more knowledge than what you have that knowledge produce an experience, and it's because it's only surface. It's not a deep thought. You haven't understood it because you haven't meditated until you see it. And not only see Jesus doing it or seeing Paul doing it or somebody else, but you have to see yourself doing it. You have to see yourself doing it on the inside. You have to see yourself able to do what God has told you to do. That's meditation. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Man, there's so many things I'm saying here that I could spend more time on. But this, you meditate, talking is part of meditation. You have to speak it. Everything is voice activated. Have you ever heard yourself on a recording? And you know what? Most people don't like it because you think that doesn't sound like me. You hear yourself differently than other people hear you because other people are hearing you with their outer ear. You're hearing yourself on the inside. You hear yourself differently than you hear anybody else. And so when you hear yourself on a recording, it doesn't sound like you. The point I'm making is that your words affect you differently than just hearing somebody else say it. You are hearing it on the inside. And so for you to meditate, you have to begin to speak and say by his stripes, I was healed. I will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I am above only and not beneath. I am the head and not the tail. It, your self-talk is important. There's a lot of you that if you come to a meeting like this and if you're talking to me and if I ask you stuff, you know what to say. You will talk one way to me, but then when you're by yourself and nobody's around, you'll talk totally different. You'll think things to yourself. You will think on things that you would never say in front of me. You know, our students, man, I got a reputation for kind of, <laughs> I guess people will come up and say the wrong thing and I'll correct them. And anyway, they've learned how to say certain things around me but then when they're by themselves, they talk a totally different way. It's that self-talk that's important and it's part of meditation. You have to learn how to speak to yourself in faith. When I first got turned on to the Lord, one of the things I used to do was go stand in front of a mirror and stand there and look at myself eyeball to eyeball and say, you are righteous. And I remember the first time I ever said that, all the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I thought, oh God, don't strike me dead. I'm just trying to say what the Bible says. But I had this unworthiness ground into me so much, I just, I had to force myself and I'd look at myself and say, you are righteous. I was an introvert. I couldn't look at a person in the face and I said, you will speak in front of thousands and thousands and millions of people. And I had to talk to myself. And some of you think, well, you just psyched yourself up. No, I'm taking the Word of God and speaking it. And when you hear yourself speaking the Word of God, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. You have to speak it over and over and over. And you got to speak the Word of God to yourself. You got to convince yourself. 
Amen. Man, I just thought of a dozen scriptures that go along with that. I hadn't got time to get into those. Look over here in Romans chapter 8. I was really wanting to get to these verses. I'm just going to have to jump over. Romans chapter 8. If all of these things that I'm saying about imagination is true, which it is, and if it is so powerful, and if it's what we're built around, and if this is how we function, and you can't really believe God and remember, and you have to have a vivid imagination in order to conceive. If all of these things be true, then why aren't, why isn't imagination spoken of in a positive light in the Bible? The only verse in the Bible that I have found that uses the word imagination in a positive way is 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 18, where David was praying that he, the Lord would help the people remember what they had seen that day. Keep this forever in the thoughts of the imagination of their heart. And that's the only positive use. Every other time, Genesis 6, 5, there imagination was only evil continually. God remembers our frame. He knows that we're just dust. And he's talking about our, our imagination, how it's negative. Over in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse uh, 5, I used this last night. It says that the weapons of our warfare, verse 3, are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every time the word imagination is used, it's talked about negatively. If it's so powerful, why isn't it talked about in a positive way? And I've wondered that for years. And then one day I was reading over here in Romans chapter 8, and look at this, in Romans chapter 8, and in verse um, 24, it's talking about the creation is going to be delivered. They are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And in verse 24, it says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And as I was reading this, I was thinking, hope can't be seen. If you're operating in hope, you're believing for things that you can't see. And all of a sudden I made the connection that this is what your imagination is. Your imagination is the ability to see with your heart what you can't see with your eyes. And I use those scriptures that we're walking by faith and not by sight. We are seeing things that can't be seen. And all of a sudden it just dawned on me that a positive imagination is referred to as hope. And so the scripture doesn't use imagination usually except to talk about it in the negative. But when it's positive imagination, it's what the Bible is calling hope. Hope is seeing something positive that can't be seen with your physical eyes. It's not present at this time, but it's out in the future and you have to see it through the eyes of faith. That's talking about your imagination. And boy, when I saw this, this just opened up all kinds of things to me. That hope is the positive use of your imagination. And there are hundreds and hundreds of scriptures about hope, about how that God is our hope, how that we have to put our hope in the Lord. And just on and on it goes. In uh, Ephes or Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about that God, in order to give a strong hope to us, he gave us these promises and God's word is good. He doesn't have to do anything to validate it, but because of our weakness, he swore by himself. He didn't have to swear, but he did it just to reassure us so that we might have a strong hope that enters into that within the veil. This is talking about into the very holy of holies. It's like your hope is an anchor that keeps you from just being blown around when things happen to you. If you have a strong hope, if you have a strong imagination that is focused upon God, it keeps you centered on God. It keeps you from going up and down like a yo-yo. It keeps you from being blown about with every wind of doctrine. So your hope is an imagination. You can take every time the word hope is used, this is talking about the positive use of your imagination. 
Look over here in Hebrews chapter 11. I referred to this verse last night. But in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Last night I was talking primarily about your imagination being the evidence of things not seen. But the first part of that verse says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith only brings into reality things that you have hoped for. And if you put all this together, what I've been saying, faith only brings into reality the things that you have seen positively in your imagination. Your imagination is conceptions, what the Hebrew word means, and it's where you conceive it. And faith brings to birth the things that you have conceived in your imagination. Man, I don't know if that helps you, but that blesses me. And see, there's a lot of people that try and skip this step. step. Matter of fact, among many faith people, you'll hear them talk about faith and hope. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now about it, faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And so we will, we will put love on a pedestal. We'll put faith on a pedestal. But did you know what? Most people don't put hope on a pedestal. Matter of fact, I've even heard people before, somebody says, are you healed? Well, I hope so. And they'll immediately jump on them. You don't need to be hoping. You need to believe. And we look at hope as if it's something bad. Most people don't really embrace hope and see the power of hope. But this verse, Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. If there's nothing hoped for, faith doesn't have anything to give substance to. If hope hasn't conceived it, faith can't birth it. You know, I was listening to Charles Capps one time and he was teaching along these lines and he told a story about a guy that was in the backwoods someplace and he came to a meeting and he came into this meeting. There was thousands of people in this place and it was hot in there and he was beginning to fan himself and an usher walked up and touched this thing on the wall and within just seconds, he started feeling cold air blow on him. And this guy thought that was the greatest thing. He didn't remember anything about the message. He just was thinking about that thing on the wall. So as soon as the meeting was over, he went up to that usher and he says, what did you do? He says, you touched that thing on the wall and cold air started blowing. He says, what is that thing? And the usher says, well, it's a thermostat. And he says, can anybody get a thermostat? And he said, oh yeah, it, you, anybody can have a thermostat. He says, where do you get one? He says, at a hardware store. So on this guy's way back to his, you know, hut out in the woods, he stopped and bought a thermostat. And he put it on the wall of his cabin. And when he got hot, he went over there and turned that thing. And he didn't feel any cold air. And he thought that, you know, what's wrong? But see, it's not the thermostat that produces the cold. You've got a power unit. You've got this air conditioning unit that produces the cold, but the thermostat controls the power unit. Hope is to faith like a thermostat is to an uh, air conditioner. Your hope is what activates things. If you can't see it, and you're trying to believe for healing, but if you can't see yourself healed, the thermostat has not been turned. The power unit's not going to turn on. The truth is you already have faith on the inside of you. Every born again believer has the faith of the Son of God. I hadn't got time to teach on that, but I got a great message entitled The Faith of God. You've already got all of the faith that you need. You don't have a faith problem. What you've got is a thermostat problem a hope problem. You have not seen it. You are trying to believe. You're trying to activate your faith without, first of all, having hope. Without, first of all, using your imagination. You know, Jamie and I, one time, we were going to go buy a car and we didn't, it wasn't a crisis situation. Our car hadn't broken down. The one we had was okay, but it was just time to buy a new car. And so I got to thinking about it thinking about what kind of car do we want? And we thought, well, we'll just go down to a car dealership and just, you know, ask some questions. We weren't ready to buy. We didn't have the money to buy, but we just thought we'd go ask some questions. 
Well, we went down to this dealership and see these car salesmen, they, they may not know what I'm talking about. They may not use my terminology, but they know these principles. They know these principles. I was sitting in there and I just wanted to know what's the warranty? How many miles do you get? What's cover? I was asking these technical questions. This guy was shunning every one of these questions. And he says, oh, you need to go sit in the car. Smell this new car smell. You know, you can go buy a new car smell in a spray bottle. <laughs> but I said, no, I don't want to buy a car today. I'm just asking some questions. Oh, no, you got to try it out. And anyway, he got me into a car, had me drive it around the block, the new car smell. Does, oh, wouldn't you look good in this? What color do you like? You know, they talk about all this frivolous stuff. And anyway, I had no motivation I just went there because it was something I was beginning the process of making a decision. But after he got me in that car, feeling that car, and it was clean, mine wasn't as clean, it was nice, it didn't have any scratches, it smelled good. You know what? By the time I got home, I stayed up most of the night sitting here figuring how could I do this and if I did this. And boy, all of a sudden, man, my faith was working. I was trying to figure out how can I afford this car? You know what he did? He quickened my imagination. He, he wanted me to see myself in that car and then go back and see myself in my old car. That's what they do. You know, this is what all advertisement is about. When they advertise beer, they don't show you a drunk laying in the gutter, <laughs> puking up and his family has left him and the guy, is a, he's dying of cirrhosis of the liver. They'll show you these beautiful animals traipsing through the snow in Colorado and they'll have all of these awesome things going on. You know why? Because they want you to have a mental image that associates something positive with that. You know, I've never tasted beer in my life. I don't know what it tastes like, but I've had a lot of people who drank beer and I mean were alcoholics and hooked on it and they said at first they hated it that it tastes terrible. To me, it looks terrible. It smells, I, I'm not even going to tell you what it reminds me of. <laughs> but you had to somewhere be sold on this because it does not taste good the first time. It's like smoking a cigarette. The first time you smoke a cigarette, it makes you cough and turn green and throw up and you, and you just made your, you wanted to be cool like the Marlboro man or whatever. And, <laughs> You know what? They give you an image that makes you associate positive things with something that's going to kill you. I've read a thing that every cigarette takes seven minutes off of your life. You just click seven minutes off of your life. And on and on we could go. But see, they, these advertisers know that. And so they present these positive images because they understand the power of image, of imagination. All of marketing is about branding. They want you to have a brand. They want you to be able to recognize their thing. They want something positive. And all of this has to do with imagination. Your imagination, once you get your imagination kicked in, I guarantee you that power unit of faith will start working. But most people skip this step. They think this is childish. Again, I explained that the first night, that imagination and fantasy are totally different things. Your imagination is a creative force. It's a powerful thing. And before you can operate in faith for healing, you got to first of all begin to hope to be healed. You may not be at the place yet to where you can believe that you are healed, but you should be at a place where I'm going to hope that I can be healed. I'm going to open up my heart and receive the testimony of People like Renee Buller down here died and was raised from the dead. She had cirrhosis of the liver and was brought back. And right here's a, a testimony. We had Linda Dees here this week. I don't know if she's still here. Are you here, Linda? Where are you, Linda? Wave at us if you're here. She's way at the back. And Linda Dees had arthritis, was crippled with arthritis. And her husband saw me on TV and came in and had her watch it and asked her to stand up and she was scared to, but finally she stood up, she was in her nightgown and she got healed and she just took off running, ran out of the house and down the street because she was healed. And when she got back into the house, her husband was laying on the floor and she thought he had died of a heart attack. 
but he was laying on the floor, stretched out under the power of God, and she's totally healed, still healed of arthritis. We had Amber. Is Amber still here, the lady that was healed of cancer? Right here? Right here. Stand up and let them see your good head, head of hair. Was that just last year or... 2014, she came to a meeting and she had had chemotherapy. She was totally bald. We prayed for her and within 24 hours or 48 hours, her hair had already grown a quarter of an inch. And there, here she is now, three years, two years later, totally healed, cancer free, full head of hair. You know what, if you can't believe, if you can't believe for healing, well, then say, you know what? I'm going to take what they've done and I'm going to start imagining and I'm going to start hoping that I can be healed. But see, some people have no hope. The doctors go out of their way to give you no hope. They do not want to raise your hopes. And you know why? It's liability issues. If they encourage you and you don't take the full treatment and follow through and do everything, and if you were to die they get sued. The love of money is the root of all evil. And because of this, there is a mindset in the medical profession today that they are not going to get your hopes up. They do not want to encourage you. They want to give you worst case scenario every time to make you in fear so that you by fear will do everything they say. And if you do die or if you never get healed, they'll be off the hook. There's a tendency for ministers to do the same thing. I prayed with somebody this week and they came up and says, man, I'm healed. There's no traces of it. Do I quit my medicine? You know, that puts me in a bad spot. <laughs> because if they aren't believing and I say, well, man, quit your medicine and they quit and then they die, here I am left holding the bag. Somebody's going to say, you're responsible. And so the, I, I deal with the same issues. You know what I tell people? I said, I wouldn't take it. You know why I don't take your medication? Because I don't believe I'm sick. If you're taking it, it's because you believe you're sick. So if you believe you're sick, maybe you need to take it. But if you believe you're healed, you, you may need to wean yourself off of it. Maybe you need to come off of it cold turkey. Maybe you need to wait until you see a manifestation. I don't know what to tell you. What I tell people is, I said, that's what the Holy Spirit's for. Pray and let the Holy Spirit give you wisdom. You can't operate on my faith. What is God telling you to do? And that's the way I deal with it. I'm not against doctors. I'm not against a veterinarian. But you know what? I wouldn't take my dog to a vet. You know why? I hadn't got a dog. <laughs> If you got a dog, maybe you need to take it to the vet, but I don't have a dog. If you believe you're sick, maybe you need to take that treatment. Maybe you need to take those medicines, but you know what? I don't believe I'm sick, and so I don't take it. But you need to do what you have faith to do. And if you aren't at the place that I am, well, then start by just saying, Father, I may not be there yet, but I can start hoping. I can start dreaming. I can start picturing myself well. And see, hope gives some faith something to work for. Faith gives substance to things that are hoped for. We don't need to disparage hope. Hope is not the end result. Hope is a step in the process, though, and it's an important step, and we need to start hoping. Amen. You know what? We are now, we need over three and a half million dollars a month. I could use $6 million a month real easy. But I wasn't at this stage 20 years ago, 10 years ago. I wasn't there. And if God would have given me the responsibilities and the things I'm doing now back then, you know what? It would have killed me. I couldn't see it. But man, I've been nurturing this. And now I was talking to Paul. We were, we were having lunch together yesterday and I was telling him that I can't see this $3 million extra Per month at this point, but I can hope for it. Amen. I am in the process of developing that. I can see an extra million and a half a month coming in easy. 
And based on that, we've started up our construction and we're going to be putting out 1.1, 1.2 million extra per month for the next seven months to get a certain project done. I can see that. I've already got that. But you know what? I'm still working on the 3 million extra per month. And I don't feel condemned about it. It's just where I am. Maybe I should be further down the road, but it's just where I am at the moment. And I'm in the process. I can't quite grasp it yet, but I'm hoping. I'm moving in that direction. And you, you hide and watch. There will be a time that as I keep nurturing this and meditating and speaking and talking about it, something's going to happen and I'll see it. And I'll know that I've got it. And once I see it on the inside, I guarantee you we will see it on the outside. It will happen. It's going to happen. And I'm in the process of doing that. We're, we're moving towards a hundred million dollar income in the next year or two is where our hope is right now. And it's not a solid hope. It's still developing, but you hide and watch. It will happen. I don't know how it'll happen. I don't know if there's one person that's going to give a lot of money or I'd really rather have a lot of people involved in my vision because if it's only one person, boy, you get them upset at you and there goes your income. I'd rather have a lot of people with me. And if one person gets bent out of shape, it's not going to make that big of a difference. Amen. But it's going to happen. And everything that God's showing me, it's going to come to pass. And this is the same process for every one of us, brothers and sisters. I'm telling you, an imagination is what, call, is what the Bible calls hope. And hope is one of the big three. Now about it, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You need hope. You need a positive imagination. You need to take the scriptures and meditate on them. Speak it over and over and over and speak to yourself and confess it out to other people. Spend time. I'm not trying to get you out of the Word of God, but I'm saying that you read the words, you study, but then you take it and meditate on it. You know, I was meditating in Deuteronomy chapter 31 this morning. And I got some great things out of that. I saw some things I'd never seen before. And I read the verses, but then I sat there and I just thought about it. And I started picturing these things and what God was saying to me about it. And it's going to make a difference in my life. You know, the way I minister, I teach our students uh, that I very, very seldom ever use notes. I've used a few notes this week because I had definitions, things that aren't in the Bible. If they aren't in the Bible, <laughs> I don't know them. But things in the Bible, I focus on things that are in the Bible to the point that it's just a part of me. It's not in my mind. It's in my heart. It's in my imagination. And I teach our students that if you would live the Word of God, you'll never have to struggle about communicating it to other people. It's just like when Jamie and I got married. We, have an hour, we had an hour and 45 minute service with preaching and singing and an invitation and we went out with the hallelujah course. And you know what? If you were to say, what was your wedding like? I don't have to say, well, let me pray and let me get out my notes and let me study and I'll come back to you next week and tell you. No, I was there. I've experienced it. It was real. I could tell you about my wedding. I could tell you about my son being raised from dead. I can tell you about things because I was there. And the reason that I can just share things is because the Word isn't just uh, something that I study. I don't ever study the Bible to get something to teach other people. I never do that. I have never studied and prepared a message for somebody else in my life. What I do is study for me. And I take it and I meditate on it until God does something to me. And then once it's happened to me, it's just as simple as telling you what God told me. I've lived it. It's a part of me. It's like one beggar telling another beggar where there's a free meal. I can tell you about healing because I've been healed. I can tell you about prosperity because I've been prospered. I can tell you about seeing the sick heal because I've seen it happen. I can tell you about things because I've lived it 
And this is what I'm trying to get across is that you've got to take the Word and it's got to be more than just words on a page. It's got to come alive. It's got to be living. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick. That means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God is alive. How does it come alive? In your imagination. That's where the life that's in the Word gets planted in your imagination. You conceive whatever it is that you need, and then you give it some time and a birth will follow. Man, that is powerful. And yet it's amazing how few people do this process. We use our imagination primarily in negative ways, but for positive things, we think, oh, I just want to deal in reality. Your, your Holy Ghost inspired, Word inspired imagination is reality. You can get to where what you see is more real than what you feel. Amen. See with your heart. That's absolutely true. You know, let me give this one last illustration that we were holding what we call a campus days where people come. Matter of fact, next week is our campus days. But we, uh, many years ago, we were at a hotel, a Holiday Inn, and I was sitting on the front row and I was sitting on an aisle like this and there was an aisle here and there were these double doors over here on the side. We had two or 300 people in this thing and I was sitting there and Jamie was up leading the praise and worship and it was just a really powerful time. She was singing hallelujah and we were worshiping the Lord and I had my eyes closed. And with my eyes closed, I just saw these double doors over there. They were on these... Um, I don't know these things that, you know, when you open them, they close slowly and stuff, some kind of an opener. And I saw these doors just wham, fly open like this. And Jesus was standing there. And then he stepped in front of the doors and just stood there and those doors closed slowly behind him. And then he walked over here and there were two ladies that now run our uh, Chicago school and our Indiana school. They were over here on the side. And um, he walked over and touched one of them on the head, just like that. And I mean, she just fell flat on her face like this with her arms out, spread eagle, just worshiping the Lord. And then there was two people in between her and she touched that, he touched that next woman and she hit her knees and put her hands up in the air like this. And I saw all of this in my imagination. I didn't see it with my eyes. I saw it in my heart, my eyes were closed. But it was so real to me that I actually opened up my eyes and looked over there to see what was happening. And the moment I looked, those doors just wham, flew open like this, but there was nobody there, couldn't see anything. And then they closed real slowly. And I just kept looking and all of a sudden that first woman just bam, hit the floor, spread eagle like this. And then I waited a minute or two and then here was the next lady and she hit her knees and put her hands up in the air and started worshiping the Lord. And you know what? Everything I saw in my heart, I could see with my eyes, except I could only see the physical things that were happening. I couldn't see the Lord behind the scenes. I couldn't see this. And you know what? I actually closed my eyes because I could see better with my heart than I could see with my eyes. And I closed my eyes and in, in my heart, the Lord came over and laid his hands on me and spoke some things to me that answered questions. And then he just started down the aisle touching people and speaking to people. And when the service was over, I walked up to these people because I knew a bunch of them, they were students. And I walked up and I said, what happened to you during that? And they spoke to me and repeated to me exactly what the Lord was, I was hearing the Lord tell them. And you know what? I never saw these things with my eyes. I never heard them with my ears, but I heard it in my heart. We can walk by faith and not by sight. You can get to what you see in your heart is more real than what you see with your eyes. When we dedicated our building in Colorado Springs, people were just shouting and praising God. And I was blessed. I was standing there clapping and praising God, but I wasn't overly excited and I had a woman come up and says, you don't act excited. Aren't you excited about seeing what God has done? And I said, I saw this years ago. 
I said, to see it with my eyes is anticlimactic. I saw it years ago. There's people that all the time, man, you know, they come and they say, hey, they found this thing about Noah's Ark. If we could just get this out to people and prove that Noah's Ark was there. What they're trying to do is to say, if you could give something tangible, if you could prove this, then people will believe. Faith gives substance to things hoped for. You can't argue a person into faith. You can't prove it. You know, we've had Angie stand up, healed of cancer. We got Renee, raised from the dead. We got Linda back here, healed of arthritis, and on and on we could go. I bet you there's numbers of people in here that have been raised from the dead. We've got miracles, blind eyes on. We've had people run this week. We've had people get out of their wheelchairs this week. We've had all kinds of miracles. But you know what? That doesn't give people faith. That might give you hope. And if you will conceive it and think, well, if God did it for them, he'll do it for me. And if you get to operating in hope, then your hope can conceive a miracle and ultimately faith will be the by byproduct of it. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not through miracles. Miracles are like a bell that gets your attention and they may get you to considering something that you've not considered before and they'll get you to thinking about it. But you can't prove anything to anybody. When I give these testimonies about people being raised from the dead, I've had people come and say, why don't you verify this? And why don't you get the doctors on here? And why don't you do things and prove to people and make people believe? You know, in the Bible, there was something like that where a man died and went to hell. And in hell, he told Abraham, he says, send Lazarus back to witness to my brothers. And, they, and he said, they've got the law and the prophets. And he said, oh, they won't listen to the word, but if one rose from the dead, they'll believe. And he said, if they don't believe the word of God, they will not believe though one rose from the dead. People who are so excited about, let's do something in the natural to make people believe are people that don't have much faith. They're carnal and they're looking for some physical thing to hang their faith on. I'm telling you that you can get to where you walk by faith and what you see in your heart, inspired by the word of God, quickened by the Holy Spirit, can be more real to you than what you feel. You know, I, about seven years ago, I went and played golf. I got sunburned really badly. I had this blister come up on my ear and I had that for a few months and I got tired of it. And so I just ripped the thing off, <laughs> tore it off. I got tired of it and I don't know what happened, but for six years I had this huge thing on my ear and I'd Never went to a doctor, but I've got a doctor on my board and I had lots of people come up and tell me, that's a melanoma, you got cancer. I was at Pastor Dean Melton's church in Charlotte and I prayed for, in one day for two people that had the exact same thing and it had their ear cut off and wanted me to come and pray over that ear. So here I was laying hands on their ear while my ear had this big old thing on it. And you know what? I just... I never bothered about that thing. I believed, I spoke to it, and I pity everybody else that had to look at it. I didn't have to look at it. <laughs> and I just believed I was healed. And it took six years. I don't know why it took six years. I'm sure it was my problem, not, maybe I didn't take it seriously enough. I don't know, but you know what? After six years, it's over. And I saw myself healed and I had people, I had thousands of people. What's wrong with your ear? I'm healed in the name of Jesus. I must have said it a thousand times. I told it to people and I don't know why it took so long. It's probably me, but you know what? It worked is what I'm getting at. I may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but man, I'll eventually cut the thing if I just keep after it, amen. <laughs> And I'm telling you, you just need to take encouragement. If God can do things for me, God can do it for anybody in here. You've got this creative force, this imagination, hope. And if you started hoping, it's just a matter of time until, man, that thing is quickened, it conceives. And just like a woman, you know, she doesn't give birth the day she gets pregnant. It takes a period of time, but you give it time, you nurture it, and I guarantee you there will come a birth. There will come a day when you see that thing birthed. And then people will say, well, man, that was quick. No, it took nine months. 
There's people that look at me, our students come now and they see what's happening and they see the blessings. I just had a brand new $93,000 Cadillac Escalade given to me. And you know what? They see things like that and they say, well, bless God, I'm going to believe for that. Well, yes, you can, but you know what? I've been at this for 48 years and I've been sowing seed and it took a while for me to get to where I am. Don't be discouraged if you don't get your Cadillac in the next month. It might take you 48 years, but you know what? Start the process. Somebody said, well, what if it takes me a year? Well, you can't get there any quicker than to start today. If it's going to take you a year, start today, and a year from now, you'll have it. Amen? Man, this is awesome. I hope this is helping you, but it... This is how God has changed my life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for the Word of God. Thank you, Father, for hope. Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Thank you that hope comes by hearing the Word of God, seeing these things, meditating on it. And Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters that they would receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit today. That they would begin to hope. That they would on purpose start focusing on the Word of God, the promises of the Word of God, and meditate on it until it paints a picture. Until they can see it on the inside. Until they have hope that things are going to be better. That things are going to change. Father, I thank you for this and we just receive this and I plant these seeds today. And if you tarry, I believe that years in the future, people will come to me and talk about how that this just changed the way that they believed, changed the way that they operated and all of the good results that came out of it. Thank you, Jesus. We receive this and thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Let me ask again today that if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus personally, you must be born again. If you just believe that God exists, James 2, 19 says, you believe that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But won't you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. It takes more than just an acknowledgement that God exists. You have to commit your life to Him. And if there's somebody in here who has never personally just turned your life over to God and trusted Him for everything. You need to do that today. And when you do that, you'll be changed on the inside. And then once you do that, you also need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said you would receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And the Holy Spirit will help you to see things in a positive light. He will give you hope. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that hope maketh not a, or how does that go? <laughs> hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The Holy Spirit will give you hope. He will shed the love of God abroad in your heart. And when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, there's many things that happen, but one, one of them is that you speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is powerful. You know, I wish I had time to, to relate, speaking in tongues to everything I've been saying, but the way that I get my imagination going, I spend hours praying in tongues. We've got this new building under construction and I just spent this last week three or four hours walking around in that building at night when nobody else is there praying in tongues, looking and seeing. Not seeing what I could see with my eyes, but seeing with my heart. Praying in tongues, and it forms an image on the inside. I see things. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues. If there's anybody here that hasn't received Jesus as your personal Savior, or if you have done that, but if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, you need to do that. And we would like to minister to you this morning we would encourage you to come. I'd like to ask right now our prayer ministers, if they would, to come forward. And we're going to have our prayer ministers stand here across the front. And if you need one or both of those things, I'd like to give you an invitation right now to come forward. Any one of these people can minister to you. Richard here is a pastor of a church. All of these are students, people that have been 
sitting under the Word, any one of them can share with you how to receive. If you need to receive something, come forward right now. Also, if you need healing in your body, maybe your faith has been quickened. Maybe some of you would just say today, I'm not really ready to believe at this moment, but I'm ready to start hoping. I want you to pray with me that I'll get a strong hope that will activate my faith. You need to come and let somebody agree with you. If there's any way we can minister to you, that's what all of our prayer ministers are for. And we would like to encourage you to please come and receive.